the great aim of all religion is fellowship with their God, to know him as friend and to, to enter his presence with joy and not fear. And, and so it therefore follows that the supreme problem of religion is sin, for, for it is sin that breaks fellowship with God. Now, man, whether he acknowledges it or not, and folks, as we look around today, as we look around now, we see more now than ever before a world out there who wants to deny that, that God exists or they want to shun off God. Now, I'm going to go back to Scripture. The scripture tells us the fool hath said in his heart. He said in his heart there is no God. And, and, and the way it reads, it really means no God. And, it, and it's, not, it's not an intellectual observation of, yeah, I just really don't believe there's a God. It is a throwing off of God. No God. No God for me is, is really what's being said there. So the, the problem we have is, is this sin that separates us. And Romans 1.19 says, Because what may, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All man is without excuse. God has not left people out here floating around wondering what's going on. He has created within each one of us an understanding that there is a God, that we, we have that void in us. They understand. They look around at nature. And when you read through Romans 1, we understand that. And you come here to verse 20, it says they are without excuse. So man, whether man wants to acknowledge it or not, man knows that there is a God, and they know there's a problem. How do we know that? Because everywhere in the world we see religion. We see religions trying to get back to God, trying to get in right relationship with God. And so whether people acknowledge it or not, they understand it in their heart of hearts, deep down. They understand that there is sin that has broken relationship with God. And, and so they understand they're a sinner and they're trying to get back to God. So it is, it is with that it's, that we're going to look this morning is how do we get back into right relationship with God? So we come here to verse John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Now, what John, John's not saying there, and he's talking to believers as he writes this, he's not saying here that Christians don't sin. He's not, he's not implying that at all. He's saying we shouldn't sin. Our goal should be not to sin. The fact is we're going to sin. We're human. We will not be perfect this side of glory. And so there will be sin. But what he's not saying is, look, you know, just go and sin and do all you want so that God's grace can abound. That's not, that's, you know, that was Rasputin who, who took that idea of, you know, we'll sin, we'll enjoy the flesh so that God's grace can abound because that's it's a perversion of Scripture and it's a false belief. It's a heresy. And it's also not given so, listen, you've been forgiven of your sin, so don't worry about it. Sin. It's not a license to sin. So John is saying so that you may not sin. He's telling us we shouldn't sin. We should strive not to sin. But he goes on, he says, if anyone, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, he himself, here in verse 2, he himself, Jesus, and only Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. So then, then the question comes up, well, what does that, that's a big word. That's a word we don't use that. I would, I would guess you've not used that word unless you're talking about this verse or these verses that speak of propitiation or you're in a theological conversation, that you've not used that word in an, everyday, in an everyday conversation. So it's a word that we don't use much, and maybe even the idea of what that really means is hard to grasp. But I want to share that with you this morning. That's what we're looking at. So propitiation, if I'm going to make it very, very simple to start out, I would define propitiation this way, atoning sacrifice. It's an atoning sacrifice, and what that means is sacrifice to make amends or reparations, all right? So it's, we're trying, to, we're trying to, to, to get back in right relationship, and we would do that through propitiation, an atoning sacrifice. There's a couple of meanings of this word I want us to look at. The first is this. So if we're using the word propitiation and the subject, the subject is man. If man is the subject, then it means this. It means to placate or to pacify someone who has been injured or offended, and especially to placate a god. It is to bring a sacrifice or to perform a ritual whereby a god offended by sin is placated. Now, the word placated means to be pacified or calmed or soothed or appeased or made peace with. So it, 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 is, it, is, uh, it is to meet the problem of our sin 
that all sacrifice arises. And we look around and we see sacrifice in, in, in areas of life. People, what do we do? We want to make ourselves feel better? We sacrifice. We give something. We do that in our own lives. And, you know, I think about pulling, when people pull up and they see somebody begging, and, man, I'm driving a nice car. They're out here on the street. I'm going to give them money to make myself feel better. That's the idea kind of here is I'm going to do something to placate this feeling. But this is much, much deeper here. It's something we do. Now, when the man is the subject, the idea is that man is doing this. Man is trying to placate. Man is trying to fix this problem with God. And so by sacrifice, uh, the, 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 by sacrifice, fellowship is restored. That's the idea. Is they're going to restore fellowship by the sacrifice. So anger is appeased, destruction is delayed, whatever it may be. And you think about uh, religions... As I was thinking about this world religions, uh, as a kid, I can remember talk about, because I, li- I love to study the Mayans and the different Aztec Indians and different ones, and there were, there were always these, these thoughts of they would take and they would sacrifice to a volcano. So pagans around the world, when a volcano is getting ready, it's rumbling and it's spitting a little bit, that they would take and they would want to offer something to the, the God that is making the earth rumble. They understand there's a God, but they don't know who God is, and they found a false God, and whoever it is they're worshiping, then they want to go and pacify that God. So they would go, and, and there, there's talk that they would take food and different things and throw in. They would offer something to the God in hopes that it would appease the God and calm the God to the extent that they would even take virgins and throw them into the volcano. So you've heard of these things, of sacrifice to volcanoes. It, there are a lot of movies and different things about the Mayans and the sacrifices they made. We were in Chichen Itza years ago, and they have an entire temple there that is built. And at the top of that, there's an altar there where they made blood sacrifices. They killed animals. They killed people. They, they just killed them right there, knife them and kill them. And that was an offering made to their god, a sun god or a moon god or whoever, to appease that God, to try to come back into right relationship with them. Even the Jews, as you read in the Old Testament, there were Jews that got into idolatry, that got into false worship, into false religion. They even offered their children to Moloch, throwing them into fires. Can you imagine the barbaric practice of of offering your child to, to throwing them in a fire for a God? But that's where this goes, this idea of making an appeasement to a God. So these false religions, they did what they could do or thought they could do, trying to make right with their God. But folks, there is nothing they can do, and there's nothing that we can do to to make that relationship right. The relationship with God Almighty that has been broken cannot be made right by something that we do. So now we come to the second definition here of propitiation. So when God is the subject of this, when we're looking at this and God is the subject, this is what it means. It means to forgive. For then the meaning is that God himself provides the means whereby the lost relationship between him and man is restored. So we saw in the first definition, it's all about man trying to reach God. That won't work. We cannot do it. There's no way we can offer and make that substantiation. There's no way we can make that propitiation. There's no way we can do something to appease God. God does the propitiating. God does the work. And and so that's the second definition, and that's what we're looking at. And so it is here that we come to this amazing good news that we're going to see today. So to explain the meaning of propitiation, think with me about four words, wrath, justice, holiness, and love. All right, these four words, wrath, justice, holiness, and love. Now, these words describe four characteristics of God. Uh, Have you ever wondered why... And I've heard people express this. Why is it that God can't just wave his hand and say, all your sin's forgiven? You're just forgiven. Jan, you're forgiven. And, and, and that didn't work. So your sin is forgiven. Listen, God is a God of love, but he is also a God of holiness and of justice. Amen? He's a holy God. Now, so because sin is an offense to God's holy nature, as well as his sovereign rule of the universe, he has righteous anger towards sin. He has a righteous anger. Paul summed it up this way in Romans 1.18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So think about the sin problem for a moment. That is a universal problem. Paul says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned. Not most, not some, not a few, not many. All. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means all of us. If you've drawn breath, you have sinned. There is sin. 
You are a sinner. You are separated from God by your sin. And we cannot, we cannot atone for our sin or forgive ourselves of our sin. Boy, that would be great if I could just go, Conrad, you're forgiven. That was a horrible thing you did, but you're forgiven. We can't do that. Now, I can say it. I can even go out and try to live like I believe that, but it doesn't change the fact that I cannot do anything to atone for my own sin. I can't forgive my own sin. So if our sins are to be forgiven, someone who is without sin must pray to pay the price for that sin. There must be a sinless offering, a sinless substitution, a sinless sacrifice. Our only hope of escape from the just penalty, and that's God's wrath, from the just penalty of our sin is if someone who is not himself under the penalty stands in our place as our substitution, okay? There's only one in the entire universe who could do that and only one who did do that, and it is only Jesus Christ who could provide that sacrifice. He is the only one because he is the God-man. He is all God. He is all man. He never sinned. He was a sinless sacrifice. He is the only one who could make that substitution for us. And so the reason God cannot wave his hand and simply forgive all our sins and allow everyone into heaven is because sin is real and God is holy. You know, if it, 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 I'm going off for a second, but if you, if you go to a court of law and someone has broken the law, the judge is there simply to judge according to the law. And if someone's broken the law and they walk in for judgment and the judge just throws it out, there's no judgment, there's no price paid for it, how just is that judge? The law has been broken. The law calls for a penalty to be paid. And so if he just throws it out, he's not a just judge. And our God is not a just God if he just waves his hands and does away with, with sin. Sin, by law, has to be judged. So his righteous anger stands against all sin, and justice must be served in such a way that sin is paid for. So Jesus paid that price when he died on the cross to satisfy the penalty of the law that condemned us. Amen? So, why did Jesus die in our place as our substitute to deal with our sin problem? Why did he do that? It's simple, John 3.16. Just go to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, at the cross of Calvary, God's wrath, his love, his justice, and his holiness all came together. God's holiness makes sin an offense to his character. God's justice demands payment for that sin. God's love causes him to love sinners. Because he, of God's love, he sent his only son, Jesus, into the world to die on the cross for the world's sins. God's wrath was poured out in judgment upon Jesus, who bore our sins on the cross as our substitute. And because of his love, by his death on the cross for our sins, Jesus satisfies the wrath and justice of God Almighty. That's good news. That's good news. Thus, when John says Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, he means that God himself provides the means whereby the lost relationship between God and man is restored. He proved himself, uh, I'm sorry, he provided himself as the sacrifice for our sins to reconcile us to himself. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. Jesus did it. God provided his son to die for us so that we could be redeemed and reconciled to God. God did all the work, not us. There's nothing we did do. There's nothing we could do. There's nothing we can do. It's all God in this work of salvation. So as I consider my sin and I think about uh, pride and lust and anger and hate and greed and lies and wrath and theft and unforgiving and deceit and gossip and backbiting and malice and fornication and sloth and apathy, bad attitudes, corrupt communications, impure thoughts, sinful actions, and you add to the laundry list there. Those sin, the scripture says if I'm guilty of one, I'm guilty of all. So if, I, if I've sinned in anything, I've sinned in everything. I'm guilty of all of it. Jesus paid for my sin by substituting himself for me on the cross of Calvary. So God's wrath for sin, his justice and righteousness has been satisfied. The price has been paid for us by Jesus for God's great love with which he loved us. He is the propitiation for our sins. He's your propitiation. He's my propitiation. He has been the substitute. He's taken it. It's done. It's taken care of. So, 
We get this idea now of him as our propitiation, as Christ as our propitiation. Now we go back to verse 1, and let's look at this again. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Now we can better understand this word of advocate, okay? Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate. Now, an advocate is one who is called alongside to help in a time of need. We've all maybe had an advocate. We use that word. We would relate to that word. There are children sometimes that are in, in, brought into, taken out of homes or whatever, and they'll assign someone to that child as an advocate. They're speaking for that child. They're helping that child. They're defending that child. They're, they're providing information. They're, they're there to help. They come alongside in that time of need. They're an advocate. Now, John uses the word, the same word, several times in John chapters 14 through 16, and there that word is translated helper, okay? Speaking of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. But here this word is translated advocate because it means not only one who, who, who is called alongside to help, but listen to this, but one who lends his voice in our defense, one who speaks up on our behalf. Jesus is our advocate. It means Jesus lends voice to our defense. He, he speaks up on our behalf. He's more than just someone who stands beside you and to give you moral support. He is there to voice his support. He is there to speak on your behalf. He is there to stand up for you and to voice your defense. So therefore, as a believer, we actually have two advocates, right? So we have an advocate in our life here that indwells us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he speaks on behalf of us uh, of God to us, and he convicts us. So if you say you're a Christian and you're never convicted, you sin and there's no conviction, then I'll tell you unashamedly, you're not a Christian. Because as a believer, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and indwells us, and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us and leads us and guides us and brings conviction. And so when we do fail, he is speaking from God to us to convict us of sin that draws us then back into right relationship with God. We also have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, who speaks to, to God on our behalf. So as the author of Hebrews says in, in chapter 7, verse 25, says that Jesus lives to make intercession for us. He is interceding for us. He is advocating for us all the time. That is Jesus. Jesus alone is my advocate. The reason he alone is my advocate is because he alone paid the price for my sin. No one else. Jesus did that. So we go again and think of the courtroom that I'm speaking of, and we, we go back and consider the courtroom, and, and maybe it'll better help us understand this concept of an advocate as Christ is our advocate. So in the courtroom scene, there's at least four people involved, all right? There's four there. There's the judge, the prosecutor, there's the defense attorney, and the defendant. So in this picture, get in your mind this picture of a court, okay? So as, as, we, as we think of this, think of this court scene. And God is there. He's on the bench. He's sitting there. He is the judge. God, God Almighty is the judge. The prosecutor, the one who is bringing the accusations, is Satan. Romans 12, uh, Revelation 12.10 says, For the accuser of the brethren. This is Satan, the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night. This is a great verse because it says, Has been thrown down. He has been cast down. His doom is coming. But we know right now, we understand that Satan has access to the very throne of God, and he is called the accuser of the brethren. He is the prosecuting attorney. He is the one railing with accusations against us constantly, each one of us. So we, we are the accused. So in this court scene, we're the accused, and then there's our defense attorney. Now, you might want Perry Mason. I don't think Perry Mason ever lost a case. I used to love to watch Perry Mason. And uh, I don't think he ever lost a case. Uh, it was amazing. But I don't want Perry Mason as my, as my uh, attorney. I, I'll take Jesus. Jesus is our attorney. He's our defense attorney, and he intercedes with, with the judge on our behalf. Now, it's really rare to have a, a defense attorney and the judge being like father and son, but it's, it's, it's legal in this case, and this is the way God has set it up. So uh, the, our, our attorney is the judge's son, and he, and he speaks to the Father, he speaks to the judge on our behalf. What a picture we have. So when Conrad Westbrook sins, you know, I can imagine Satan rushing to the presence of God to accuse me. He goes in and I can almost hear, you know, as he's quoting scripture, scripture concerning the penalties of sin and how Conrad ought to be punished. He should be, the, the penalty of that is death. And, and God, this, this man is guilty. He's done this and he should be guilty and, and condemned to death. 
And, and then I can imagine my de- defense attorney as the Lord Jesus Christ, and the whole time that Satan's making those accusations, he just sits there, and I'm looking at him, and he, he's, he, I'm like, are, are you going to say anything? <laughs> and he's just there, and he's just, and when Satan's done running his mouth, Satan, uh, you know, he's brought all those railing accusations against us, and Jesus steps up, and he says, yes, Father. Conrad is guilty of that sin. But, Father, I went to the cross and died for that sin. And when Conrad was 13 years old, through faith in me, my atonement was applied to him, and his sin, his sins were forgiven. I put my righteousness on him. He is covered by my blood, and he is forgiven because he is my child. That's the scene. And see, in that courtroom, my merits, my merits are never discussed. It's only the merits of the Son of God. He is the only one. My advocate, it is on his merits. Now, we can't discuss my merits because I don't have any. Christ is the one who is sinless. It's all his merits, and that is what the Lord Jesus brings to the judge, God the Father. And and God just says, it's thrown out. Jesus was our our atoning sacrifice for our sins then. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins today. I'm afraid some of us feel like Robert McShane, McShane when he said this about sin. He said, I feel when I have sinned an immediate reluctance to go to Christ. I'm ashamed to go. I feel as if, if it would do no good, uh, no good to go, as if it were making Christ a minister of sin, to go straight from the swine trough to the best robe and a thousand other excuses. But I'm persuaded they are all lies direct from hell. See, when we sin, we have an advocate, Jesus the righteous. He pleads our case. And and as a child of God, if if we have accepted him, he says, that sin is paid for. That sin is paid for. That sin is paid for. And so we should not pull away from God. We should draw close to God. And as soon as we're convicted of a sin, we should go right to him. I'll tell you, anything that pushes you away from God in that way is not of God. Period. When condemnation comes, see, we as believers, we're, there is no condemnation for us as believers. And Satan will use that condemnation in your life. He will seek to push you away from God, and he does that through that guilt and condemnation. Christ doesn't do that. He brings conviction. He says, he says brother, sister, he says, child, I love you. That is wrong. You know that's wrong. C- come back to me. Confess that to me. Let's get this right. And when we turn to him, he's right there and the relationship is restored. Speaking of this, uh, about Christians who sin, Luther wisely noted this. He said, if, any, if someone errs and sins, he, would not, he should not add to, sin, to that the sin of despair. After sin, the devil always alarms the heart and makes us tremble, for he hurls a person into sin in order that he may finally force him into despair. On the other hand, he lets some live smugly without temptation in order that they may think and believe that they are holy. This is his cunning. He wants to make saints sinners and confident sinners saints. Folks, when we sin, and it's not, you know, it's not, and if someone sins, and really it's not an if, it's a when. When we sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is our propitiation for our sins. Jesus is able to be our advocate and to forgive sin because he himself became the sacrifice for our sin. Praise God. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at this as we finish that verse. His propitiation extends as far as sin extends. Okay? Verse 2 again, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but, but also, for the, for, uh, also for the whole world. So Jesus is the propitiation not only for our sins as believers, but also for those of the whole world. This v- v- verse raises the question to the extent of the atonement for, those, uh, for, those, uh, for whose sins did Christ die? That's the question that, that comes in mind right here when the, when the verse is read. And there are two views on the subject to the extent of the atonement. Now, some believe that Jesus died only for the sins of those who believe in Christ. And this view is traditionally called limited atonement. 
Others believe that Jesus died for the sins of all people, and these are the only two possible views that we can have in, in, in regard to this question. So what does John mean when he says that Jesus is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world? Now, those who believe Jesus died only for the sins of those who believe in him, that's the limited atonement position, they would suggest to us that when when John uses the phrase the whole world, he doesn't mean all the people in the world. Now, rather, there's three things here that we'll look at different interpretations. So the first is this. Some say that John intends the phrase not for our ours only or our sin only uh, to refer to the Jewish believers and the phrase for the whole world refers to all Gentile believers. The second interpretation, some say the phrase for the whole world refers to all kinds of people but not to all people individually. The third says some would uh, some say the, the, the word world here means the world of the elect, the elect being those who will be saved. Now there's, there's some major problems with all three of these interpretations. It's impossible to determine that John's letter was addressed solely to Jewish believers. So we, we, we can't take that, 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 that he was writing to Jews, and that's then the terminology there, because we, we can't determine that that letter was just written to Jewish believers. In fact, most scholars suggest that the readers were mainly Gentile, or at the very least, a mixture of Jewish and Gentile believers. The use of the adjective whole here, whole modifying world, makes it difficult to interpret the fa- phrase as referring to all kinds of people rather than all people individually. He says the whole world. So when we take that, it, we, we can't make it to mean we meant the whole world in that uh, to all peoples, just not to all people. See what I'm saying? Like to all nations or all different dynamics of people throughout the world, but not to all people. And then D.A. Carson noted the word world is never used by John or anywhere else in the Bible to mean the world of the elect. Okay? So a face value reading of verse 2, we understand the whole world to be a reference to all humanity, to all people. And it's based on two things. First, the use of the phrase for the whole world uh, in this context includes all the people of the world. Okay, So world here is a figure of speech in which one term is used in place of another. We get that. But we see it in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world. Didn't, didn't specify, said the world. And that word is cosmos, and it means the people of the world. So here, uh, using this figure of speech, John is using the word world to mean all the people who live in the world. Notice John's use of the, the word world in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, where it's clear that the word, the word here means all unsaved humanity. In, in 1 John 5, 19, he says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So he's talking about the whole world. So it's, he's talking about those all lost people who have not been born again. So the word world there doesn't mean that. So th- th- this, the, the, uh, this is important because contextually in 1 John, the word world never means the elect. It's never in that whole book of 1 John. He's never, John never uses that word uh, to mean the elect. So the word... Uh, world is cosmos, and again, it's the same word here in 1 John 5, 19. It's the same word that's used in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and it's the same word used in John 3, 16, and in other places. Second, the use of the Greek adjective holos, which means whole, further indicates that John intends to include all people in this designation. He says, the whole world, holos, cosmos, the whole world in its entirety. So the death of Jesus on the cross Listen, was a death for the sins of all people. Jesus substituted himself for the sins of all humanity. Hear me here. That does not mean, now understand, because there are those who would argue, well, if he died for the sins of the whole world and for everybody, then you're talking about universalism, and, and, and that's not the case here. Jesus substituted himself for the sins of all humanity, but it does not mean that everyone is going to be saved. So this verse is not teaching universalism. It doesn't mean that because he, he paid for the sins of the whole world that everyone is instantly, they're all saved, they're all going to heaven. The verse is simply teaching that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, meaning the sins of all John's intended readers and by extension all believers, and he is also the propitiation for all humanity. So this means that the sins of all people were imputed to Christ on the cross. All sins. 
And people will deny this. Um, and, and, and I respect the view on that. That's not my view. And I don't believe that it's the, I don't believe it's the teaching of Scripture. The, the sins of the whole world were laid on Christ. He died for all the sins. He died for Hitler's sins, for Stalin's sins, for my sin. If I'm guilty of one, I'm guilty of all. Now, there are different consequences, and I'm not trying to say I'm Hitler, but, but for me to say I'm not Hitler and act like I'm more righteous than him, I was just as lost as him. I was going to hell just like he was or did. Okay? Jesus satisfied the legal debt of sin for all, such that all humanity, listen, is savable should they meet God's condition for salvation, which is repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, makes a clear statement concerning the extent of the atonement, and it is for the whole world. Jesus died for the whole world. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prof, uh, teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. He's talking about lost people right there. False prophets, they're lost, and he says they're denying the very Lord who bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. These are false prophets. They're lost people. 1 John chapter 4, verse 14 and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, all then, then all died. All died, and he, verse 15, and he, Christ, died for all. Verse 18, Now all, these, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their, trespass, their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. These are believers who had been saved. They understood that Christ died for the whole world. Their ministry, our ministry, folks, is the ministry of reconciliation. It is to go and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. Amen? Hebrews 2.9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For everyone. 1 Timothy 2.4, God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Scriptures are very, very clear. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. The Scriptures again and again and again and again make it very clear that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for the sin of the whole world. Not a select few, not an elect few. He, he died for everyone. He has made the way for everyone. And so no one has excuse. The price has been paid. He has been there. He has taken their sin. The penalty has been paid for. But it still comes through faith. Salvation, it is applied through faith. God's grace through faith. So what are the implications of these two, these two verses for us today? So these verses all affirm that God desires the salvation of all people. His will is that all would come to repentance. All would come to a saving faith. 1 Corinthians 5, 3. Some would say, well, you know, we don't have to go and tell people that it's never commanded. We go and tell people that, that you know, God died for their sins, that Jesus died for their sins. Except when Paul gives us the gospel, the gospel, Aaron, Pastor Aaron and I were talking about this verse this morning about the gospel. Listen, this is not the gospel. Okay? I hear people sometimes go, well, they're, they're, they're teaching something in Genesis and, and they never present the gospel. Well, the gospel is the whole Bible. No, the gospel is not the whole Bible. The whole Bible speaks of the gospel, but it's not the gospel. Paul makes it very clear what the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the good news. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He's telling, he's talking here to believers. But when he was first telling them and he first brought the gospel to them, he told them Christ died for our sins. 
He died for my sins. He died for your sins. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We, our job is to go and to plead with this lost and dying world to tell everyone Christ died for your sins. You can be born again. In Acts chapter 3, verse 26, Peter preaches to his Jewish, Jewish audience there. He says, To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you, to bring away every one of you from your iniquities. Now, the only way, the only way every one of them could be turned from their iniquity is if Christ had died for every one of them. That's it. And so we must be diligent to fulfill the commission that our Lord gave us as he ascended back into heaven. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples. Again, not everybody's going to get saved. Folks, we have lost people sitting in this group right now under my voice that are hearing the gospel today, and there's a good chance they're going to walk out of here today without receiving the gospel. My prayer is if you're sitting here and you've never trusted Christ for salvation, You've never come to that place where you realize my sin has separated me from God. I am bound for hell. God is speaking to my heart. I need to come to him in repentance and trust him by faith. Then I, I, would, I plead with you today, don't leave here. If you've never come to that place, do not leave here. Get that right with God. Go, there, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I love, I love some... Uh, I, I, I was about to give a football reference, but y'all would it would go right over your head. I'm going to do it anyway. T.O., Terrell Owens, back in the day, I don't know, 15 years ago, pretty, pretty good receiver in the NFL. And T.O. made a comment one day. He said, I love me some me. Anybody heard that? All right, I, he was shaking his head as soon as I said that. He knew what I was going to say. He, he said, I love me some meat. Boy, that's a great picture of pride, isn't it? That's a picture of pride. I, all that to say, I love me some J.C. Ryle. I love me some J.C. Ryle. I want, I want you to hear what he says here. J.C. Ryle said, I, give, I will give place to no one in maintaining that Jesus loves all mankind, came into the world for all, died for all, provided redemption uh, provided redemption sufficient for all, calls on all, invites all, commands all to repent and believe, and ought to be offered to all freely, fully, unreservedly, directly, unconditionally, without money and without price. If I did not hold this, I dare not get into a pulpit and should not understand how to preach the gospel. But while I hold all this, I maintain firmly that Jesus does special work for those who believe which he does not do for others. He quickens them by his spirit, calls them by his grace, washes them in his blood, justifies them, sanctifies them, keeps them, leads them, and continually intercedes for them that they may not fall. If I did not believe all this, I should be a very miserable, unhappy Christian. Now, I've long contended that one of the greatest evangelistic and missionary motives is the fact that God loves all Christ died for all sin, and that, that God desires the salvation of all. That's his desire. And, and so we, we are called to go and share the gospel. We're called to go and share the gospel with all. Mark 16, 15, our verse right over here, our verse for this year as we focus on mission is this, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Christ died for you. Christ died for you. Christ died for you. Luther expressed it in his own unique way. He said, do not let your heart deceive you by saying, the Lord died for Peter and Paul. He rendered satisfaction for them, not for me. Therefore, let everyone who has sinned be summoned here, for he has made the expiation for the, for the, for the sins of the whole world and bore the sins of the whole world. For all the godless have been put together and called, but they refuse to accept. Spurgeon said, if a man goes to heaven, it's all of God. 
if a man goes to hell, it's all of him. It's all of man. And that makes sense. It makes sense when the Lord has paid for all the sins of the whole world. There is no excuse. You have been offered. He has died for you. He died in your place. Your sin debt has been taken care of. You don't get to go to heaven just because he died on the cross for your sin. You still have to come by faith. And when you come by faith and place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone, then he saves us by his grace. And, and, and listen, faith is not a work. Abraham, it was, was, it was by faith that he was counted righteous. It was by faith. That is not a work. Our faith is not a work. Read Romans, I think it's Romans 4, speaks of that. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. And so as we look to mission, we look to going and doing the Great Commission, the mission that God has called us to and sent us out on, We've got it right here this morning. There's some of you sitting here that don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Today is the day of salvation. You're not promised an hour from now. An hour from now, I could get a phone call that, that somebody has been in a wreck and they've gone off into eternity. I pray that you're prepared to go off into eternity. And the only way you're prepared to go off into eternity, right, Mike? Michael, you ready to go off into eternity? Amen. A week ago, a week and a half ago, Mike wasn't ready to go off into eternity. But he got it right. He come to the Lord. He understood and he has confessed his sin. He has he turned from that sin. He's called on the name of the Lord. And Mike, are you saved? Amen. 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 He doesn't question it. Today, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I plead with you. The Lord pleads with you. I'm begging with you. Come to the Lord. And folks, we, we have a job to do right here. We, we, we're presenting the gospel right here to little kids. To little older kids, to little bigger kids, to grown kids, to old kids, okay? Jesus' is kids, God's kids. We're presenting this, this gospel. We're teaching the gospel. We're making disciples right here. We all need to be involved in that work. And then there's work out beyond First Baptist Geneva in our community here. We got a community of lost people that need to hear the gospel. That Christ died for your sins. He's made a way. Come to him. And all the world, it just keeps extended out to the uttermost parts of the world. It's what we're called to do. It starts right here. It doesn't end right here. But it starts right here. And if we're going to take it around the world, we got to start right here. Some of you have never shared your faith with another person. Some of you have never told someone that Jesus died for them, that Jesus has made a way for them, that he is the Savior of the world. They're a sinner, and he will save them. Some of you have never shared the gospel. Folks, it starts with us, not somebody else, us. So this morning, the invitation is simple. If you need to come down here, and I'll take the word of God. I'll share with you scriptures real quick. I'll introduce you to Jesus, and if you're ready, if you're ready, you, you, you'll have to call on him. I can't save you. I had a guy come up one time, I was standing with my pastor in Georgia, he came up and said, you know, preacher, years ago, you saved me. And the preacher said, yeah, you look like something I'd save. <laughs> you look like something I'd save. He said, son, I ain't saved nobody. I can't save anybody. All I can do is I'll point you to Jesus. I, I'll introduce you to him. But you, you're the one that's going to have to come to that relationship. you got to, by faith, put your faith in him. This morning, if that's you and you need that, I invite you to come. Don't worry about anybody else in this room. I ain't, but, I ain't but one person you ought to be worried about right now. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christian, where are you at? Do you have a heart geared toward evangelism? Do you have a heart that, do you care? Do you care that the people around us are dying and going to hell? Do you care? If you don't care, maybe that's a need of prayer this morning. Maybe you do care. Maybe there's five, six people on your mind. Maybe we ought to be at the altar this morning praying for somebody. That they'll get saved. Praying for that person that God will give you opportunity to be the one to share the gospel with them. All that Jesus did for us. What a sin if we sit on that and not share it with them. Pastor Aaron.